Now, with elections looming, ineffective moderation on social media platforms has allowed them to become tools to spread fake news. My guest in studio tonight, Mark Kaigua. He's a technology and marketing professional leading Nendo, a digital growth services firm based here in Nairobi. Many thanks for joining us, Mark. Before we get into our conversation, let's take a look at what exactly is happening in this current environment and just get a scope of what fake news is all about and what the impact actually is. Let's um, take a look. All right. We'll talk about online disinformation, TikTok, Facebook, Twitter has been found to be hosting political disinformation. And that is part of what we'll be talking about with Mark here this evening. And the posts include hate speech, incitement against ethnic communities, cyber harassment against female political aspirants, and so on. Social media firms have also been accused of failing to police harmful content. And let's proceed and take a look at what um, current surveys are saying about this issue. And the Reuters Institute um, says that 75% of Kenyan news consumers find it hard to distinguish between real and fake news online. So send in your comments on double two four double two. The hashtag is Friday night at Lillian underscore Muli at Citizen TV Kenya. Mark. Uh, back to our conversation, examples of how disinformation is being spread on this social media, rather in this social media space, and who this disinformation targets. So generally, even with the word disinformation or false news or that, that general bucket, you could say, there's actually a split there. A lot of the viewers right now, Lillian, they might, they might have actually forwarded something. Uh, in fact, what we say um, on a project that my team and I are running called StopReflectVerify.com is we can be tricked by the trending topics to believing that these are ordinary citizens discussing a real issue of national importance. When it isn't, it's what uh, we might describe as thumbs for hire or people who are paid to prop up a topic. Uh, we could be shamed into sharing. Sometimes you, you might have seen it, again, viewers too, where they say, you know what, um, if you don't send this to people, I'm going to question your integrity. I'm going to question your loyalty. I'm going to question all things about you. So you're in some ways shamed into sharing. Mm -hmm. And then for the most part, to forward is to lend your voice. And Kenyans have this phrase. They say, they say, ah, centers received. So the examples are many. It's everything from what I'd call quote pics, a photo of a popular politician, and then a quote that just has nothing to do either with that point or what they've said. Um, it could be videos, whether it's, an, it's a real video, uh -huh. but the caption is changed or it's out of the accurate time when it was shared. So we have so many examples that are out there, but many of them, it, it's us, everyday people, sharing and spreading them. And that's part of the challenge in addition to the algorithms that are fueling and spreading them at the same time. And looking at the online soldiers and the fact that this is fast becoming a cottage industry in terms of social media influencers that are actually paid to disseminate this information. Let's take a look at that. So I think this mirrors what happens to some extent offline, right? You can go to a political rally and there's been some investigative pieces that have gone into this. And some of the people there are what you might call a crowd for hire. The same way online, you might say, hey, look, I'm seeing hundreds of people talk about this issue or talk about this party or person. And in that same case, not everybody might just be an everyday citizen lending their voice. So it mirrors that way. And these are pretty well-coordinated networks that have, you know, essentially, like you said, a cottage industry of people being paid, being given topics, angles, in many cases, even visuals. There's designers who are then creating the visuals that will stimulate and trend and actually get the conversation going in favor or against mm -hmm. the particular um, issue at hand. Now, these are sensitive times, Mark, because um, we're just a couple of weeks to the general election. So how to control the use of multiple accounts to propagate the same message? I mean, essentially, we're saying this is the same person, but to the consumer, this is the narrative. This is the spread. This is the vibe around this particular issue on this particular day. So how to control that? I mean, this is one of the big challenges. And I don't think it's up to us in the sense that it's up to the platforms. I think Twitter, Facebook, um, I to some, some extent even TikTok, they say, and, I, and I, I can definitely testify with a lot of what I've seen over time, that they've made some steps to make sure that what they collectively call, but mainly Facebook calls this or Meta, 
coordinated, inauthentic behavior doesn't take place or take root. Mm -hmm. Now, there are some challenges. The heart of the issue is always going to be the algorithm and the lack of transparency. Mm -hmm. But you've talked about what are called sock puppet accounts. If you imagine a little playtime show, this hand comes up and says something, this hand comes up and says something, and sometimes the back and forth, it's me on both of them. Mm -hmm. Now, like you said, you can multiply that by dozens of accounts. There have been some limitations for IP address and other technical ones, but it rests, the burden of, of responsibility rests with the platforms because people are really trying to skirt around the rules, mm -hmm. but there's a number of steps being taken to eradicate these accounts or lock them or suspend them mm -hmm. to make sure it's real people engaging on real terms. But when you look at some of the community guidelines, some of the hate speech or um, the issues raised on some of these platforms take days to be pulled down. Um, say I come out and say, look, somebody has violated my rights um, and somebody has said something about me, it would still take days. And that's why I was asking, we're going into a very sensitive period. So in terms of community guidelines, Facebook, Twitter, what do we know about what they've done and how deliberate and intentional they've been as regards this particular period? I think Meta has, has announced that, that they have um, a plan that includes a dedicated team and a certain center and certain measures they're going to take you know, pre, during, and, and post-election. Mm -hmm. uh, we are going to hold them, I think, to a very high standard and high uh, set of expectations. Okay. But at the heart of it, what you said is that they need to do more. Mm -hmm. um, this is a very sensitive time for the country. And like you said, that idea that hateful, insightful, potentially, you know, even worse types of content can stay up there with no consequences, that's tough. Now, what fact checkers are trying to do to catch up with this is if they flag me for sharing um, basically content that gets you know proven as false, sometimes that can impact me personally. Mm -hmm. If I'm the admin of a page or even on my personal account, some of the, the, the reach that, that that would happen after would be slowed. But the problem, like you said, is that window of opportunity when it can reach people and potentially influence them or challenge them or discourage them or worse. Right. And in terms of women political aspirants, and I'm not saying that men are not subjected to the same, but I do know that you've done some research around this issue and the cyber harassment that is directed to the female political aspirants. That's correct. I mean, we have uh, multiple deputy presidential candidates, um, you know, essentially for the, the highest office in the land as far as the ticket is concerned. Uh, and, and we have essentially a historic moment as far as women's participation there. Same for many gubernatorial races. But I'm telling you, Lillian, according to what we saw at Nendo on social media, what female political aspirants, actually even people in the media, not too different to yourself, are subjected to on a regular basis. Uh, we did some research with an organization called She Persisted and just really looked at six months of data and they get subjected to pretty strong types of abuse, sexism, misogyny, um, uh, trolling, uh, even, even to the point where people are holding them to almost unequal standards compared to their male counterparts when it comes to their education, to expectations of marriage and other uh, gender stereotypes. So this is part of what they have to deal with as an extra burden. Mm -hmm. And some of those, it's hard to tell, are these everyday people who are my voters or my constituency, or are these people generally who just are essentially you know, instigating uh, and coming and, and expressing and holding these, these tough uh, ob objectives? And in some cases, some of that content stays up for quite a while, mm -hmm. which in some cases could discourage people from vying or from actually being available and accessible online.